I'm now going to talk about the environmental Kuznets curve. The environmental Kuznets curve is not to be confused with a Kuznets curve named after uh, Simon Kuznets, who you see here. Uh, Kuznets argued that uh, subsistence economies are very egalitarian, uh, and if they grew richer, they grew more unequal, uh, but then if they grew richer still, uh, inequality started falling again. And you see that displayed in this uh, graph. Here you have um, uh, the logarithm of GDP per capita, here the Gini index, a measure of economic inequality. And with a bit of uh, imagination, you indeed see a quadratic uh, curve here that poorer countries are more equal, richer countries are more equal, but in between countries are fairly unequal. Um, and this would apply to environmental uh, issues as well, and the reasoning uh, is as follows. Uh, that uh, subsistence economies are largely agriculture, put very little pressure on the environment. Uh, then as economies start to industrialize, they put more and more pressure on the environment. Uh, but as they then shift to a service economy, the pressure on the environment uh, starts falling uh, again. Uh, so that's the theory. Um, and this was popularized by the two gentlemen you see here, Gene Grossman and the late great Alan Kruger. Um, and they published uh, uh, two empirical papers where uh, they looked uh, at this first relationship between per capita GDP and uh, urban air pollution, where you see, uh, particularly if you're focusing on smoke in cities, you see indeed sort of a Kuznets uh, type of shape. Um, there, uh, it's a bit less clear for sulfur dioxide, whereas for heavy particles, um, they seem to be just a downward uh, trajectory. Um, if we then move to um, indicators of water quality, um, we look at biological oxygen demands, uh, mainly uh, quadratic shape, chemical oxygen demands is a bit clearer. Um, but for dissolved oxygen, it's a bit unclear. Um, it's actually going the wrong way. We may just be in the upward trajectory of uh, the quadratic curve. Uh, but for nitrates, there may be uh, a shape uh, that suggests there is a good sense curve. Uh, further uh, indicated, this, uh, in this case, biological uh, contamination uh, of rivers. Fecal coliform, yes, there is a good sense curve for total coliform. Uh, it's a bit unclear what is going on. Uh, this is um, essentially driven by uh, fertilizer use, intensification of agriculture. Um, and then if you move to um, heavy metals uh, in water, uh, you again see a variety of shape, uh, shapes, uh, lead, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, uh, nickel, it's a bit unclear uh, what is uh, going on here. It doesn't seem to be uh, the nice uh, nice predicted theoretical uh, curve. Um, in the same papers, they sort of force a quadratic curve uh, through um, data uh, for the indicators that you saw, and then if you assume that there is a hill shape, then you will find a hill shape, um, and this is uh, where the peak uh, lies. Uh, and for the turning point where, as you grow richer, the environment gets better, uh, it's very, very different uh, for the different uh, indicators. Um, so the lowest is lead, uh, where lead concentrations start falling if income is above $1,900 uh, per person per year. Uh, but for nitrates, uh, no, for cadmium, uh, you need to go up to almost $12,000 per person per year before um, uh, before environmental pressure uh, starts falling as you grow richer. Um, they also show uh, these numbers. This is whether you go up and down once you've reached $10,000 uh, per person per year or $12,000 per person per year. Uh, and what they find is that once you exceed this $12,000 uh, per person per year threshold, the environment gets better on every 
single indicator except for total color form uh, in water that uh, keeps uh, getting worse. Um, so there is, and the same is true actually for the Zolpax. Uh, so there is some suggestion that this particular curve holds, that there is such a thing as the environmental uh, goodness curve in uh, this paper that was published very well and a lot of people uh, set up and paid attention to this. Um, and this has spawned a large literature um, because it got into people's imagination and it's a relatively straightforward thing uh, to do. Uh, so a lot of people uh, started doing it and there is by now a large literature and still growing literature on the environmental goodness curve. Um, and the newer papers do all sorts of things different uh, than what uh, Grossman and Kruger did. Uh, they look at different indicators of environmental quality, essentially as new data become available um, then uh, they are being used. Uh, they looked at different uh, countries or groups of countries or uh, how uh, they looked at sectors within countries rather than the total economy. Uh, and they looked at um, different time periods than the original paper did. Uh, of course, I mean, the original papers were published um, now almost 20 uh, years ago. Of course, a lot of new data has come online. So that is one thing that people have done, but they've also tried to push it back further in time. Um, they've tried different uh, specifications uh, of the uh, assumed relationship. Grossman Kruger essentially assumed it was a quadratic relationship, but people have tried all sorts of other uh, different shapes. Um, and of course, as the econometric uh, software and econometric theory developed, people tried different estimators uh, and applied them to the same problem. Uh, and the result is that by now there are hundreds and hundreds, um, if not thousands, of papers on the environmental good sense curve. Um, and Kruger styled himself uh, as a labor economist, but really his most cited paper is in the environment. Um, this has led to uh, two review papers, one by David Stern and one by Maccio Galliotti. Uh, Maccio Galliotti titled this paper, Desperately Seeking uh, the Environmental Kutznets Curve. Um, and um, Stern, um, that, that was a reference to a, a movie uh, that starred Madonna, uh, back in the day when Madonna was somebody. Um, David Stern titled this paper, The Rise and Fall of the EKC, the Environmental Business Curve. And this literature that is now out there, this large literature, essentially shows the same sort of confusion that was in the original paper. And there's all sorts of different shapes. And depending on what you look at, you may or may not be able to see an environmental goodness curve. And uh, the ambiguity of these results is not surprising. Uh, because economic growth has a number of effects, and I list five here. The first is the scale effect. If the economy is larger, we're going to use more resources, and we're going to generate more waste, and we're going to generate more emissions. So that is unambiguously negative. That's unambiguously bad for the environment. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a demand effect, uh, that as people grow richer, they start demanding a cleaner environment, uh, and that is also unambiguously uh, that's unambiguously positive uh, for uh, the environment. And it's not that poor people don't care; it's simply that poor people can't afford to express that care for the environment. But rich people do have the luxury, do have the additional resources as to start caring for their environment yeah. and have the wherewithal to actually pay uh, for those things. Um, so we have one unambiguously negative effect scale, we have one unambiguously positive effect, uh, demand for a cleaner environment that will immediately tell you that there is an ambiguous result, but it may be that it turns into a hill shape. Uh, but then uh, there are uh, ambiguous effects of economic growth on the environment as well. The first one of those uh, is the composition. And that really suggests this hill shape uh, that agricultural societies, definitely if it's subsistence agriculture, puts little pressure on the environment in terms of fertilizer use and in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of pesticide use, but it's fairly uh, 
fairly inefficient and that means that you do need a large amount of land there to support a uh, few people. Uh, so agriculture, but it's by and large, uh, if you move away from agriculture towards manufacturing, then you are going to put more pressure on the environment. Um, but then if you move away from uh, manufacturing towards services, you're going to put less pressure on the environment again, um, because people sitting in offices don't do a lot of, they don't knit um, heavy metals or things like that. <laughs> That's simply not what you do when you work in a bank or in a shop. Um, so that seems to suggest that there is an environmental goodness curve, but then there's two other ambiguous effects as well. One is technology. And uh, the good thing about technology is that efficiency tends to uh, improve resource efficiency, fuel efficiency, all those things get better over time, uh, which means that you can do more with less, one definition of technological uh, improvement, um, and that means that you put less pressure on the environment. Uh, on the other hand, we invent new things, and those new things may be bad for the environment. All the heavy metals uh, that are in computers and mobile phones and those sort of things, they used not to be there, uh, because we used not to have these things. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that new technology improves the environment. New technology can also create new environmental problems that we used not to have. Um, and then the final uh, ambiguous effect uh, is governance. Um, that richer countries are typically better governments, better governed, typically, not always, just look at the US, just look at the UK, uh, but typically uh, the quality of government is better uh, in richer countries, and that means that uh, governments are better able to deliver on public goods, such as cleaning up the environment, and better able um, to uh, correct externalities and those sort of things. Uh, because that requires a functioning uh, fiscal uh, system if you're going to go for uh, a good tax or uh, a functioning regulatory system if you go for uh, direct regulation. And those things are simply better in better government, better government and richer uh, countries. Um, on the other hand, in richer countries, governments tend to they tend not to make decisions, they tend to postpone decisions um, because everybody will have to have their say and then uh, that takes a long time and then there's a new election and then the new government wants to change its mind, it wants not to do the same thing as the previous government and so on and so forth uh, and deliberation often uh, takes years or decades in uh, richer countries. Whereas um, poorer countries and definitely more autocratic countries tend to make decisions much more quickly. Um, <clears throat> so there's no surprise that there is not, no such thing as an environmental food transfer because it's simply, theoretically, it is very complex and you just reason from first principles. Um, and that means that empirically you should actually not be surprised not to find uh, uh, that said, if we focus on local pollutants that are directly harmful to human health, um, then indeed we can discern often, but not always, an environmental goodness curve that things are fine when you're poor, they get worse when you're sort of middle income, and then they get better uh, when you get rich. Um, but that's a qualitative uh, relationship. The Quantitative uh, results are very, very different. They're different for different contaminants, different uh, environmental problems, they're different for different countries, and they're different for different uh, periods. And again, that should not surprise you. Um, because it may be that um, a health concern related to the environment pops up in a rich country, and they then invent solutions to that problem. Uh, and then those solutions, those technical solutions, may then spread to uh, poorer countries, um, <clears throat> and they have their turning point uh, earlier. One example is lead uh, in gasoline. That is something that we in rich countries uh, solved actually by accident because we needed catalytic converters to get a lot of the air pollutants um, 
like nitrogen and sulfur out of our fuel, and that is what a catalytic converter does. But if you have lead in your gasoline, that messes up your catalytic uh, converter, and for that reason, we took out the lead from our gasoline, not because we were concerned about lead. Um, but as a result, we now have gasoline without lead, and every car has a catalytic converter. Um, but there's two things that make that spill over to countries that do not care about air pollution, uh, and that is that in poorer countries, people often drive second-hand cars that used to be driven in Europe and North America uh, and Japan, uh, but no longer, right? Uh, after the useful life has ended of a car in Europe, it is sold to uh, Asia and Africa, so they drive the same cars a little bit later, so they also have catalytic converters uh, in the cars and therefore unleaded uh, gasoline. Uh, and the second is economies of scale. Even people in Africa who can afford to buy new cars buy cars that can also be sold on the European market because from a car manufacturer's perspective, it makes much more sense to develop one type of car that can be sold across the world. So you can develop your car to uh, comply to the highest environmental standards. You don't make a dirty car just for Africa. That simply doesn't make any sense for manufacturing. Um, and that is why the different turning points, for in this case lead in the environment, are different for different countries, because these things are not independent. Um, <coughs> that is true for local pollutants directly harmful to human health. And there you can often discern environmental goodness curve. For global issues such as climate change, we care about biodiversity, there is absolutely, or plastics, uh, there is absolutely no environmental goodness curve in sight. Uh, that just doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to be in the data. That's true if you're looking for total CO2 emissions, for instance. If you look at CO2 emissions per capita or CO2 emissions um, per uh, dollar earned per GDP, so the emission intensity, then sometimes environmental goodness curve pops up, uh, but not if you're looking at total uh, emissions.